Today I'm talking about chapter 20 of No Man Knows My History. Welcome to Candlewick Library. I'm Cheryl. Today I'm still talking about No Man Knows My History by Fawn Brody, and today it is chapter 20 in the Quiver of the Almighty. She starts out this chapter talking about how Joseph Smith is getting more involved in politics and more outspoken. It seems that the relative peace and respect that they're getting in Nauvoo has really fed into that, where they now feel like they can be more involved. They feel like they have a voice and they do have a voice. The political candidates are are trying to get their vote. And so they, that is that is allowing them to be more outspoken. On page 289, she again speaks about Joseph's alcohol consumption. Although Joseph controlled the dispensing of liquor and preached against grog shops, he nevertheless permitted the construction of a brewery and allowed it to advertise its beer and ale in the Nauvoo neighbor. And then further down, when Janetta Richards presented him with a bottle of wine made by her mother in England, he drank it with relish and noted the incident in his journal without apology. The only reason I even bring that up is just because this is after the word of wisdom, which to this day, LDS people do not drink alcohol at all. And they wouldn't say, oh, I can drink this bottle of wine, but the rest of the time I'm not going to drink, so I'm okay. If the average Mormon person in 2024 drank even a sip of alcohol, they would feel like they have to go to their bishop to confess and repent. So that's the only reason I bring it up. I just think it's important for people to know the person that gave them this law that they follow didn't follow it. At this point, tourists are starting to even come to Nauvoo to check out the Mormons and see what all the fuss is about. And she starts this on page 289 as well. Joseph was friendly and hospitable to the hundreds of tourists who were attracted to Nauvoo. Steamboats plying up and down the river stopped regularly to discharge visitors who were ceremoniously conducted on a tour of the city, including visits to see the mummies, the baptismal font, and the temple which was fast becoming an imposing monument. And remember, the mummies are the ones that Joseph bought with the papyri that he then turned into the Book of Abraham. The prophet had few illusions about the tourists who wanted a personal interview. When one preacher admitted frankly, I have no particular business, but I have taken the liberty to call on you, Joseph replied with wry humor, a good many call on me that, that way, to satisfy their curiosity, and go away and say, well, I've seen Joe Smith. Some of them say he is pretty good looking, smart fellow. He looks as though he knew something, as if he was not the fool and knave he has been called. But others go away and say, well, I've seen Joe Smith. He is a great blubber mouth fellow, a knave, a drunkard, a mean, ignorant fellow. I think this is one of the things that people liked about Joseph Smith, is he was very amiable and friendly to people. I mean, if you crossed him in a way that made him angry, obviously that came out. But to the average person, he was just pretty gregarious and and likable. One visitor, Henry Caswell, an Episcopalian preacher from a St. Louis college, armed himself with an ancient manuscript Psalter written in Greek and pretending to be ignorant of its contents, offered it to Joseph for his scrutiny. Under the prophet's questioning, he finally admitted that he believed the language to be Greek, but this Joseph contradicted. Caswell, exaggerating the imperfections of Joseph's grammar, later related the story as follows. No, it ain't Greek at all, Joseph said, except perhaps a few words. What ain't Greek is Egyptian, and what ain't Egyptian is Greek. This book is very valuable. It is a dictionary of Egyptian hieroglyphics. Pointing to the capital letters at the commencement of each verse, he went on. Them figures is Egyptian hieroglyphics, written in Reformed Egyptian. Them characters is like the letters that was engraved on the golden plates. So she's pointing out that he was probably exaggerating the way Joseph was speaking of them characters, or ain't. But there were others there, so we know that this is what happened. When the prophet left the room, Caswell turned triumphantly to the men present and exposed the trick. They appeared confounded for a while, he wrote, but at length the Mormon doctor said, Sometimes Mr. Smith speaks as a prophet and sometimes as a mere man. If he gave a wrong opinion respecting the book, he spoke as a mere man. That stuck out to me because not only do we now have another instance where Joseph Smith pretends he knows what he's talking about when he doesn't and pretends to be able to translate something when he can't, but we also get that phrase that is still used to this day of if a prophet was wrong, they were speaking as a man. If a prophet is right, he was speaking as a prophet. And yet we are supposed to follow the prophet. We sing it in primary, follow the prophet, follow the prophet. I can't remember how many times that primary song says follow the prophet, but I think it's 50 something times. The little kids are singing constantly. We are taught from the very beginning, follow the prophet. He knows the way, he won't lead us astray. 
and that the best thing about being a Mormon is that we have a living prophet. That's the most important thing that we have. If we had no scripture, having a living prophet would be okay because he can tell us what God wants right now. But what good is having a living prophet if you don't know whether he's speaking as a prophet or a man when he says something? Because it's easy for them to look back and say, oh, Joseph Smith got that wrong. Brigham Young got that wrong. They were speaking as a man. But what about Russell M. Nelson right now? What is he saying that as a man, if you believed he was a prophet, which I don't, there is no way to know when he is speaking as a man, when he is speaking as a prophet, if you are a member. So you have to act as if everything is as a prophet unless you are told otherwise or unless it is proven wrong. And I think it's good to note that it started right at the beginning. Joseph often said impatiently, a prophet is a prophet only when he is acting as such. Well, I thought you were a prophet all the time. That was my understanding. On page 291, she goes on to talk about the Kinderhook plates. Perhaps the most deliberate hoax ever played on Joseph Smith was contrived by three men in the near town, nearby town of Kinderhook. One of them, Bridge Witten, cut six copper sheets into the shape of a bell, and the other two, Robert Wiley and Wilbur Fugit, covered them with fanciful writing by a simple etching process. They smeared acid over the plates to corrode them, bound them together with a piece of rusted hoop iron, and carefully buried them along with some Indian bones in an Indian mound nearby that had been an object of much curiosity and digging. Wiley spread the story that he had dreamed of buried treasure three nights in succession and invited assistance in hunting for it. Two Mormons were present when the plates were found. Although they had suspected a hoax, the sight of the corroded plates banished their mistrust. Shouting for joy, they begged to take them to the prophet for deciphering. But before giving them up, Wiley was careful to clean them with sulfuric acid so that the hieroglyphics could be more easily read. The whole of Nauvoo soon buzzed with the discovery. The Times and Seasons published full reproductions as further proof of the authenticity of the Book of Mormon, and the printing office sold facsimiles at one dollar a dozen. Joseph stated in his journal that he translated a portion and discovered it to be a history of a person whose bones lay in the mound, a descendant of Ham, through the loins of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about those kinderhook plates for a minute. So it was on April 16th, it was on April 16th, 1843, when Robert Wiley told everyone that he had had this dream three nights in a row. And so he asked for the additional help to come dig it up. Joseph's translation of those plates where he said that they were from a descendant of Ham through the loins of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, that is in the church history. The Times and Seasons newspaper there in Nauvoo that was the Mormon run newspaper, not only let everyone know about the Kinderhook plates and told them how excited they were to find them and that there was a, there was a Mormon present so that everybody could believe that they had found them in the mound, but also said the content of the entire plates would be published in the Times and Season as soon as the translation was completed. Until 1980, the LDS Church claimed that the Kinderhook plates were authentic and were proof of Joseph Smith's abilities to translate and his truthfulness of a pro as a prophet and to prove that the Book of Mormon having been, been carved on these plates was possible. However, in 1981, they had to change their tune as testing was done on the plates and it was proven to be a hoax. In the August 1981 Enzyme Magazine, which is the adult magazine of the LDS Church, it said, a recent electronic and chemical analysis of a metal plate, one of the six originals, brought in 1843 to the prophet Joseph Smith in Nauvoo, Illinois, appears to solve a previously unanswered question in church history helping to further evidence that the plates is what its producers later said it was, a 19th century attempt to lure Joseph Smith into making a translation of ancient looking characters that have been etched into the plates. On LDS discussions, Mike goes into a timeline of the events and I'm gonna read a few of those. In May 7th, 1843, Apostle Parley Pratt comments on the Kinderhook plates comparing their look to the book of Abraham Papyrus. He said, Six plates having the appearance of brass have lately been dug out of a mound by a gentleman in Pike County, Illinois. They are small and filled with engravings in Egyptian language and contain the genealogy of one of the ancient Jaredites back to Ham, the son of Noah. His bones were found in the same vase made of cement. Part of the bones were 15 feet underground. A large number of citizens have seen them and compared the characters with those on the Egyptian papyrus, which is now in this city. On May 10th, 1843, the Nauvoo neighbor republished the Times and Seasons letter along with the similes of all 12 of the Kinderhook plates, and I'm going to show that here. They also include the note at the end that states the contents of the plates will be published in the Times and Seasons as soon as the translation is completed, implying that members were given the impression that a full translation was forthcoming. 
On June 30, 1879, William Fugate writes to James Cobb in Salt Lake City telling him that the Kinderhook plates were a hoax intended to trick Joseph Smith into translating the plates. It describes how the plates were faked and the process of how they were uncovered and brought to Joseph Smith. So if you pay attention to that date, that's 1879. So it is over a hundred years that the church claims these as real and nobody in all that time discerns that they're not. I'm gonna read parts of the letter that he sent to James Cobb. So this was June 30th, 1879. Mr. Cobb, I received your letter in regard to those plates and will say in answer that they are a humbug gotten up by Robert Wiley, Bridge Witten, and myself. Witten is dead. I do not know whether Wiley is or not. None of the nine persons who signed the certificate knew the secret except Wiley and I. We read in Pratt's prophecy that truth is yet to spring up out of the earth. We concluded to prove that prophecy by way of a joke. We soon made our plans and executed them. Bridge Witten cut them out of some pieces of copper. Wiley and I made the hieroglyphics by making impressions on beeswax and filling them with acid and putting it on the plates. When they were finished, we put them together with rust made of nitric acid, old iron, and lead and bound them with a piece of hoop iron, covering them completely with rust. Our plans worked admirably. A certain Sunday previous, we dug to the depth of about eight feet, there being a flat rock that sounded hollow beneath and put them under it. On the following morning, quite a number of present, including Marsh and Sharp, the rock was soon removed, but some time elapsed before the plates were discovered. I finally picked them up and exclaimed, a piece of pot metal. Fayette Grubbs snatched them from me and struck them against a rock. Dr. Harris examined them and said they had hieroglyphics on them. He took acid and removed the rust and they were soon out on ex exhibition. Under this rock, it was dome-like in appearance, about three feet in diameter. There were a few bones in the last stage of decomposition, also a few pieces of pottery and charcoal. There was no skeleton found. In December 1890, in the Overland Monthly, they report about the discovery of the Kinderhook plates. Charlotte Haven said that when Joshua Moore showed them to Joseph, the latter said that the figures on, or writing on them was similar to that in which the Book of Mormon was written. And if Mr. Moore could leave them, he thought that by the help of Revelation, he would be able to translate them. 1895. Well-known, faithful historian and general authority, B.H. Roberts, not only declares his belief in the Kinderhook plates, but goes on to attack Fugate's claim that they were a hoax. In 1930, B.H. Roberts takes William Clayton's journal entry and converts it to the first person account to be included in the history of the church. This cements Joseph Smith's partial translation of the Kinderhook plates as a credible event as they are being included in one of the most important volumes of material in church history at that point. In 1961, they included information on it in the commentary on the Book of Mormon that they put out. But on the other hand, we have the fact before us that the skeleton of the pharaoh found in Kinderhook, Illinois, referred to previously, was dug out of a large mound. After penetrating about 11 feet, the workers came to a bed of limestone that had been subjected to the action of fire. They removed the stones, which were small and easy to handle, to the depth of two feet more when they found the skeleton. This was evidently a burial chamber, as with the bones, which appeared to have been burned, was found plenty of charcoal and ashes. From this fact, it is evident that some of the mounds are a very ancient date, as it is not supposable that this man would be the only one of his race and nation to be buried in this manner. In September 1962, the president of the BYU Archaeological Society, Welby W. Ricks, wrote the following in the Improvement Era magazine. A recent discovery of one of the Kinderhook plates, which was examined by Joseph Smith Jr., reaffirms his prophetic calling and reveals the false statements made by one of the finders. The find solved a 74-year-old controversy and put the plates back into the category of genuine, which Joseph Smith Jr. had said they were in the first place. What scholars may learn from this ancient record in future years or what may be translated by divine power is an exciting thought to contemplate. This much remains. Joseph Smith Jr. stands as a true prophet and translator of ancient records by divine means and all the world is invited to investigate the truth which has sprung out of the earth and not only, the, uh, not only of the Kinderhook plates but of the Book of Mormon as well. In 1980, the Chicago Historical Society, possessor of one plate, commenced on testing the plate in order to understand its origins and thus proved once and for all that it was a 19th century creation. In his article, Mike goes on to give some of the apologetic responses from Fair Mormon or Fair Latter-day Saints, I think they're called now. One of them is that Joseph Smith translated a portion of those plates, not by claiming inspiration, but by comparing characters on the plates to those on his grammar and alphabet of the Egyptian language. So there, so it sounds basically to me like they are saying that because it had a similar character and he already had this grammar that he had written out, that he is just, oh, 
I, I see the boat, so it means the same thing. And so it wasn't translating. And, but Mike posted a picture of the boat from Joseph's Grammar and the boat from the Kinderhook plate to show that they really don't even look like that while they both feature a boat shape, there are way too many differences otherwise to consider them the same shape. Fair said this, corroborating this is a letter in the New York Herald for May 30th, 1843 from someone who signed as a Gentile. Research shows a Gentile to be a friendly non-Mormon than living in Nauvoo. The plates are evidently brass and are covered on both sides with hieroglyphics. They were brought up and shown to Joseph Smith. He compared them in my presence with his Egyptian alphabet and they were they are evidently the same characters. He therefore will be able to decipher them. And in between the, he compared them in my presence with his Egyptian alphabet, and then the end, they are evidently the same characters, there was ellipsis. And Mike points out that you might think that that means it was a long-winded response, so that so Fair just cut out the important text for space, but it's not. So this is the full quote that Fair decided to leave out. The plates were evidently brass and are covered on both sides with hieroglyphics. They were brought up and shown to Joseph Smith. He compared them in my presence with his Egyptian alphabet, which he took from the plates from which the Book of Mormon was translated, and they are evidently the same characters. So he says, now why would Fair leave out which he took from the plates from which the Book of Mormon was translated if they are not trying to keep this information from the reader? Even if this Gentile was confused between the plates from which the Book of Mormon was translated and the papyrus that the Book of, Mor the Book of Abraham was taken from, why not put the quote in full and note that this person probably was confused as to the sources? And then he goes on to say that beyond that, there's a very key and important point to understanding in this art to this argument, and that is that John Gee, one of the most well-known Egyptian scholars employed by the church, follows Hugh Nibley's argument that the grammar and Egyptian language that Joseph made was effectively reverse engineered by the scribes. And what that means is that they wrote the text of the book of Abraham on the manuscript pages, and then the scribes later went back in and would attempt to match the symbols for the Egyptian papyri to the alphabet on their own and without Joseph Smith's help. Besides that, his grammar of the alphabet and Egyptian language has been proven completely wrong. And it's been shown that he had made up that grammar. It doesn't, it's, it doesn't match up with anything correctly. Mike goes on to say, it is for this reason that the Kinderhook plates are so vitally important because they shine further light on the Book of Abraham translation issues, as well as show us that the leaders after Joseph Smith defended them as real because they believed that they were genu genuine to the point that they called Fugate, who admitted the hoax, that him admitted his admittance, him telling the truth was the hoax, not the actual thing. So once the scientific test proved that the Kinderhook plates were a hoax, then the church had to hurry and hustle to explain why they have been behind it and saying that they were real for so long. The easiest target for them was William Clayton. William Clayton was Joseph Smith's scribe and personal secretary. He wrote down everything. He wrote down the things that Joseph Smith did, the things that Joseph Smith said, and, and he was very trusted by Joseph Smith. In the 1981 Enzyme article that revealed that the Kinderhook plates were indeed a hoax, it says this, although this account appears to be the writing of Joseph Smith, it is actually an excerpt from a journal of William Clayton. It is, has been well known that the serialized history of Joseph Smith consists largely of items from other persons, personal journals, and other sources collected during Joseph Smith's lifetime and continued after the saints were in Utah, then edited and pieced together to form a history of the prophet's life in his own words. It was not uncommon in the 19th century for biographers to put the narrative in the first person when comp compiling a biographical work, even though the subject of this biography did not actually say or write all the words attributed to him. Thus, the narrative would represent a faithful report of what others felt would be helpful to print. The Clayton Journal excerpt was one item used in this way. For example, the words, I have translated a portion, originally would read, President Joseph has translated a portion. Where the ideas written by William Clayton originated is unknown. However, as, as will be pointed out later, speculation about the plates and their possible content was apparently quite unrestrained in Nauvoo when the plates first appeared. In any case, this altered version of this extract from William Clayton's journal was reprinted in the Millennial Star of 15 January 1859 and unfortunately was finally carried over into official church history when the history of Joseph Smith was edited into a book form as History of the Church in 1909. William Clayton evidently had access to the plates at some point, for in his journal entry of Monday, May 1st, he included a tracing of one of the plates. Whether or not he was present when Joseph Smith saw the plates is unknown. Two days later, on Wednesday, Brigham Young also drew an outline of one of the Kinderhook plates in a small notebook slash diary that he kept inside the drawing he wrote May 3rd, 1843, I had this at Joseph Smith's house found near Quincy. So Mike says, this idea that is unknown where Clayton got Joseph's parcel translation is absolutely ridiculous. 
he was with Joseph Smith the day that they were introduced to the Kinderhook plates. We know that Clayton was with Joseph because not only was he at Smith's home, but he officiated a marriage between Joseph Smith and his 17-year-old polygamous wife, Lucy Walker, that day. And then he goes on to say, the bottom line is that William Clayton was one of Joseph's most trusted men in the Nauvoo era. Now, because this doesn't look good, they have to, instead of saying, yeah, Joseph Smith got it wrong, again, they have to take William Clayton, a man who was just doing his job and that Joseph Smith completely trusted and throw him under the bus and say, it's him. He was incorrect or dishonest. The main points of these Kinderhook plates is that as Mike pointed out, as other people have pointed out, that this was a chance for Joseph Smith actually to prove that he was a prophet. If he had looked at him and said, oh, this is a hope. He never did translate the rest of them, probably because he didn't have enough time because he had other things that he said were part of the papyri that he never got around to translating before he died as well. But it also shows a lack of discernment, not only in him, but also in everybody up until the scientific test was done. And that is not surprising as even in the 1990s, we had Mark Hoffman that came to the church with forged documents that he made. And the second man in command right now that will be the next prophet was one of the people that met with him after, within hours of him murdering people. And they bought all of these forged documents from him. We are taught to believe that our leaders in the church have so much discernment, so much so that as a teenager, I felt like if I did something that I thought was wrong and I went in to talk to the bishop, that if I didn't confess it, he would know by looking at me. That is how much discernment we are taught to put to place on them. In the CES letter, Jen Jeremy Runnels says something along the lines of, if you went to somebody and you bought a car from them and it was junk, and then you bought a second car and then it was junk, would you buy a third one? And that's paraphrasing, I can't remember exactly the way he wrote it. And his example for that was, we have the book of Abraham, we know it was a false translation. We have the Kinderhook plates, we know that those were false. So how do we say, but the Book of Mormon was different? Later on, on page 294, she's been making a case of how some people would talk about Joseph Smith as, as being really handsome and some wouldn't. And there, there just was all these conflicting reports about him. And she's making the case of how likable he is, how confident and self-assured he is. And she says that he, uh, when he read an account of him by somebody, he said, if the reader does not know just what to make of Joseph Smith, I cannot help him out of the difficulty. I myself stand helpless before the puzzle. She goes on to say, the zest for living that he radiated never failed to inspire his own people with a sense of the richness of life. They followed him slavishly and devotedly, if only to warm themselves in the glow of his presence. They built for him, they preached for him, and made unbelievable sacrifices to carry out his orders, not only because they were convinced he was God's prophet, but also because they loved him. They were as elated when he won a wrestling match as they were awed when he dictated a new revelation. They retold tales of his generosity and tenderness, marveling that he fed so many of the poor in Nauvoo at his table without stint, and that he entertained friend and enemy alike. He was a genial host, warm-hearted and friendly to all comers, and fiercely loyal to his friends. I would add there until they crossed him. Joseph was no hair shirt prophet. He believed in the good life, with moderate self-indulgence in food and drink, occasional sport, and good entertainment. And that he succeeded in enjoying himself to the hilt detracted not at all from the semi-deification from which his people enshrouded him. Any protests of impropriety dissolved before his personal charm. Man is that he might have joy had been one of his first significant pronouncements in the Book of Mormon. And from that belief, he had never deviated. He was gregarious, expansive, and genuinely fond of people. And it is no accident that his theology, in the end, discarded all traces of Calvinism and became an ingenuous blend of supernaturalism and materialism, which promised in heaven a continuation of all earthly pleasures, work, wealth, sex, and power. She goes on to say that the result was that Mormonism became not only a belief, but also a way of life. And I think that is a really important point because that is what it is to be a Mormon. It isn't just a belief system, it is a way of life. And I think that most religions are that way, especially ones that are more high demand, but it's a little bit more than that. It's not just a way of life because you are living your religion, you're living your belief system, but it's also a way of life of we dress a certain way, we eat and drink certain things, we communicate with others in a certain way. E almost everything in your life is controlled in some way by the church, whether you realize it or not. So we can see that the people really loved him and there are so many things that nobody else would have been able to do. And we're gonna be talking about those a lot in the next couple of weeks. With that also though comes the danger of too much power. So he was able to convince people of things that they normally wouldn't have been able to be convinced of. Because he had that power over them, 
with his personality and his charm. Further down the page on 295, she says, when Josiah Quincy said to him, it seems to me, General, that you have too much power to be safely trusted to one man, he replied, in your hands or that of any other man, so much power would no doubt be dangerous. I am the only man in the world whom it would be safe to trust it with. Remember, I am a prophet. And I say it that way because she writes, but these last five words Quincy said were spoken in a rich comical aside as if in hearty recognition of the ridiculous sound they might have in the ears of a Gentile. While she is saying that Quincy understood that Joseph Smith was kind of half joking when he said that, we also know he meant it. It's very easy to see over the weeks that I've been talking about this history of the LDS church that Joseph had too much power and he did not weld it well. The next few weeks, are going to be a lot harder. I'm going to be talking about his polygamy next. And we've already discussed a little bit of Fanny Alger who is looked at as the first polygamous wife. And I, I will touch on her again and why I don't think that they were actually married. But I will also be talking about all of his other wives. This covers about four chapters in the book where they are sprinkled in and out. And I, as I come up, as I come across them in these chapters, I am going to be telling you a little bit more about each of these wives. I've been doing a lot of research of podcasts and books to try to get a, a good amount of information of them. And some of them, there's very little information and some there is a lot. I will probably be filming the video for all of those chapters all at one time and breaking it up however I need to, to fit into a certain amount of time. And so I'm not sure how many weeks it will be going over, but the first one will be coming next Sunday. And I think that as you listen to their stories, you will feel this as well, that his power and his control over these people made them do things they otherwise would not have done. And that created heartbreaking stories and lives. And I have had to stop a few times in my research because I was getting so sad. I feel like it's very important though to say these women's names out loud and to tell their story, even if they lived the rest of their life fine with polygamy and never had a bad word to say about it or Joseph Smith, their lives were still taken away from them because of him. And I, I am very eager to share their stories with you. And so hopefully you'll come back next week and then the weeks after that, we're almost done with this book series. And I think that this is, the next few weeks are going to be the most important ones.